Mad Magazine has been a staple of crude, irreverent humor for decades, a comedic rite of passage that graced many a newsstands and molded under many a teenaged beds, with an instantly recognizable mascot in Alfred E. Newman, and known quite well for its movie and television parodies. I loved the magazine growing up, along with Cracked, which I talked about last year with its send-up of Alien in 1979 in a previous video. Today, I'd like to take a look at Mad Magazine's spoof of Aliens from 1986. No doubt you may have seen this cover make its runs around the internet. It's very well known and often shared over social media. This is art from Will Elder and Harvey Kurtzman, portraying Alfred E. Newman bursting out of an alien's chest, much to the disgust of Ripley, sporting her Reebok bug stompers and pulse rifle. A very funny image, but let's take a look closer today and get deeper into the actual article. The year is 1986. Aliens, the follow-up to Ridley Scott's Alien, written and directed by James Cameron, has exploded into theaters, scaring and thrilling audiences around the world with state-of-the-art, groundbreaking special effects and pulse-pounding action scenes. And it had seen the emergence of Sigourney Weaver in the Ripley role, as an action star easily able to hold her own against the likes of Stallone and Schwarzenegger. So, what did Mad Magazine have to say about this extravaganza? The spoof was written by Dick DeBatarlo, with art by Jack Davis, and in the usual Mad style, we have the first panel introducing all the characters and setting up the general plot. And here we have an introduction from the second slime around department. Picture this. Creatures so hideous they could suck every breath of life out of you. No, we're not talking about the Internal Revenue Service. We're talking about the stars of one of this year's hottest films. Those cretins from another planet who burst out of people's stomachs, drip acid, ooze slime, torture, and never once pick up a dinner check. We're talking about... The Alienators. And here we see Ripley awake, and having nightmares after her long hypersleep. God, no. Help. I can't stand it. It's awful, this oozing, slimy thing. Is she dreaming about those hideous alien creatures again? Actually, I think she's complaining about the food again. Let me give her something to make her sleep. She's already slept for 57 years. I think we should let her get up. It's time to change the linen. So clearly they stop their grinning and drop their linen. Jonesy is also there, gagging at the foot of Ripley's bed. I hope this is a fur ball I'm about to cough up and not another alien. Looks like there's one hiding under the bed too. Uh-oh. Vasquez is present here with the doctor getting a good read on her elbow. So you're here for a physical to see if you're fit for a tough mission or not? In response, I assume Drake says no to see if she's a woman or not. Hudson, I'm sorry, Dudson, is here. The doctor informs him, you have to watch your diet more carefully. Your tests show you contain 100% chicken fat. Cause he's a chicken. Bishop is here, much to the concern of his physician. The x-rays show two batteries. You better be an android or you're in trouble. Two more doctors overviewing the scene. Ripley's status is spaced out for 57 years. 57 years in space. Who is she? She's Ripley, believe it or not. So we have everything set up. It doesn't reinvent the plot all too much or anything like that, and it sticks to a lot of the beats followed through in the movie. Ripley being awakened after 57 years, being found, and of course having to deal with all the suits that seem to want to do nothing more than make her life even harder. Inquiries, IQs dropping, you know the drill. So here we set the scene, Ripley being questioned about her actions in destroying the ship from the previous film. You claim aliens were invading human bodies and spawning eggs inside them, so you had to destroy a $200 million starship? It was the only way to kill them. They had acid for blood. Yeah, well that's nothing. Our insurance company has a rock for a heart. They refused to pay off on the company's claim for the starship you blew up. We want you to go back to DOA 426. No. Never. I'll never go back. What if I told you that even with your 57 years in space, you still need 2 million frequent flyer miles to qualify for a free trip to Puerto Rico? Okay. Okay, I'll go. Dealing with the company rules is worse than any stupid aliens. And it's off to the Sulaco she goes. Enter the ultimate badasses, the Colonial Marines, as they join along the fun and prepare to investigate just what happened on the planet. The mission begins, and the Marines get out of cryosleep. There's a nice rendition of a pwn here, barking his orders. Come on, Marines, rise and shine. You've been asleep for three weeks. Coffee's ready. Coffee is the last thing we want. The bathroom is what we want. Me first. I have to shave, says Vasquez. Ripley discovers the android. Much like in the actual film, she raises alarm, but she discovers that he's an android a little bit differently here. How did you know I am an android? Because I bled white fluid when I did that knife trick and cut myself? 
that, and the fact that you're having pancakes smothered in STP oil treatment. And there's good old chicken shit outfit Hudson again, knife stabbed into his hand. Ripley and the Marines make their way to the colony. Okay, men, we're ready to launch our Land Rover and explore DOA 426. Drop station at ready. Sequence is activated, switching from GE range to Sternocan. Septic tank plug tightened. Fuzzy dice on rearview mirror in place. St. Christopher metal secured to dashboard. Ripley interrupts. Oh, stop making it sound so technical and just hit the button marked go. And so they go, aboard the dropship. They enter into the colony and begin their rescue operation. They enter the hive, leaving the dropship behind. This cartoon interpretation is pretty good, actually. Looks close to the movie, unlike some of the Marines. What you may have been noticing already is that there are a lot of generic-looking Marines, not all necessarily counterparts to the film, though, of course, Vasquez is a major exception. She gets a lot of standout moments in this particular article. One Marine exclaims, Look at this disgusting place. Pus-filled sores in these living membrane walls. And that moldy, odored slime hanging from the ceiling. Don't touch it. Vasquez replies, What do you mean, don't touch it? I thrive on hand-to-slime combat. Can we have any fun on this lousy mission? Ripley voices her concerns about the effects the weapons may have on the station and the possibility of thermonuclear explosion and adios muchachos. In this parody article, she mentions this to Hicks, or Hex, instead of Gorman and Burke, like in the movie. Corporal Hex, the tunnel your platoon is in is right under the Ronson fuel generator. If they fire their weapons, we'll all be blown clear into the next article. Hex follows through and lets the Marines know the change of plans. Er, guys, listen up. The plan is exactly the same as before. Seek and destroy the aliens, but er, don't fire your guns. No guns? What's that leave us with? Barfing, running, and sweating profusely are all okay. Well, when you look at it that way, maybe their tactics weren't the most ideal, given the sudden change in weaponry. Maybe they could have regrouped, re-strategized, I don't know. Kind of pokes a big hole in this plot element, but maybe a story for another day, another video topic that may be something to talk about. Anyway, Dutson, not surprisingly, starts panicking. We're doomed! We're gonna die! And I only have three years, eleven months left to my four-year hitch! Oh, why does this happen to me now? Sir, on the micro-locators, there's some movement. Some different zones are highlighted on the tracker here. End Zone, Twilight Zone, the Zone Ranger, Ice Cream Zone, Zone Collins, Safety Zone, Ozone, Tilt, No Parking Zone, I Want to Be a Zone, Home Sweet Zone. We skip over to the aftermath of Ripley's rescue after taking control of the APC. No big frightening scene and daring rescue like we see in the movie, it just cuts to the very end. From the TV monitor, I saw you guys were in trouble, so I came crashing through the tunnel in this rescue tank. What's the casualty list? Three dead, four injured. Those aliens are really vicious. What aliens? That's the casualty list from your driving. So, no actual aliens yet. You'll also notice the sequence of events are a little different here. In the movie, of course, there's quite a few stops made before they enter the hive, which aren't necessarily ignored in this spoof, but the order of what happens is just a slight bit different. There's the trip to the med lab where they observe some little Charlies in stasis. Are these the aliens, Ripley? Either that or we've discovered an Italian restaurant with the galaxy's largest calamari. Of course they're aliens. Enter the discovery of Newt. Over there! Look! Help! Kill it! It's alive! Run! Run! Run for your lives! That's a little girl, you idiot. Yes, but she'll grow up to be a big girl like my mother unless we shoot her now. Then you have to appreciate how they portray Newt here. Snotty-nosed with a blankness behind the eyes and her doll matching much of the same. The bland, pale, emotionless face. The blackest eyes. The devil's eyes. Don't be afraid, little girl. We only came to blow this planet to kingdom come and kill every one of those expletive-deleted aliens. We're a friendly people, here on a mission of peace. Somebody give this kid a machine gun to use. Of course, all would be well if the group could just take off and nuke the entire site from orbit, the only way to be sure, but unfortunately, as within the movie, the dropship crashes, leaving them stranded. Hex reports the bad news in the most positive way possible. Ripley, we have another little problem. Our rescue vehicle from the mothership just auto-landed each of its 4,389 parts separately. We're doomed! I'm scared! Help! <coughs> Dutson, look at this little girl. 
She's been here with no weapons and no training, and she's not afraid. I know, but she has that doll's head. Kid, sell me that doll. I'll give you this rocket launcher for it. And take these grenades. The survivors look through the plans of the complex, or actually the World Trade Center, in an attempt to plan their survival, scanning through the ducts. The wild duct, the Donald ducts, duct tape, what's up duct, decoy ducts, duck duck, daffy duck. Oh, and hey look, a pwn's still alive. Again, not entirely 100% movie accurate. Ripley overviews the situation. We found the plans to this complex. Now we have to find a way to keep the aliens out of all the tunnels. A suggestion from Hex. How about a toll booth? Exact change only. Or we could erase the tunnels from the plans. Then the aliens won't have any to use. From Vasquez. It's a shame you two don't have any brains to use. From a random marine. We need someone to sneak outside past the aliens and use the satellite dish to call down another spacecraft. How about you, Bellhop? Burp protests. No, not Bellhop. Do you want to go instead, Burp? Me? Hell no. But if we send the android and it's destroyed, it'll cost the company a fortune to replace. I say we send the kid. Ripley and Hex later bond over the superior firepower of the Colonial Marines. Ripley, I think you should have something to protect yourself. This is the Rambo 10 rifle, with grenades, backup lights, pocket fishermen, and optional red headband. This should protect me against those aliens. I was thinking more of protecting yourself against me. I caught a glimpse of you in hypersleep. For a woman of 57 years plus, you sure look good in those gray panties and top. Oh, Hex, you charmer. Oh, and by the way, comment below if you're old enough to remember the pocket fisherman. As I understand, it was a pretty big deal. Cut to Burp's betrayal, sending the facehuggers Ripley's way. Ah! Help! Hex! Help! Burp released this alien so it would enter my body and he could smuggle it back to Earth. Why did you do it, Burp? I had my orders. Big corporations like the company have been smuggling illegal aliens for centuries. They're great cheap labor. The aliens then penetrate the complex, and it's a race for survival. They're here. Help! Don't worry, Nuke. They won't get you. I'm going to protect you as if you were my own daughter. But you must not point, dear. It's bad manners, and don't use such a loud voice. And don't slouch. Stand up straight or you'll go to bed without your dessert pill tonight. God, Nuke would have been better off with one of the aliens as her mother. Through this way, Ripley. It's a shortcut. Look, it's the mother alien giving birth. Look at all the sticky goo and yucky webs. Yuck. How disgusting. That clinches it. Nuke, I'm adopting you. I never want to go through the experience of childbirth. The alarm blares as they escape. Emergency. All personnel. This place will blow up in six minutes. Evacuate at once, but please do not steal any stationary supplies on your way out. I rescued Nuke, Bellhop, but where's the rescue craft? I couldn't align the ship with the satellite dish because the company scrambles their signal like HBO does, so I called a cab instead. You better get in, lady. The fare's already two million. Also comment below if you're old enough to remember trying to watch scrambled cable channels. You know what I'm talking about. The survivors of DOA-426 think they're safe and sound, but, of course, the Queen makes her surprise appearance. Bellhop, you've been so good through this whole scary mission, and now you go to pieces? It's the alien. It rode back with us. It's ripping Bellhop apart. I'll call a doctor. Forget a doctor. Get a good auto mechanic. Ripley faces off against the Queen while trying on some cool 80s action movie one-liners. Don't worry, Nuke. If it's one thing I know, it's how to use sophisticated machinery. Yo, alien, come on. Go for it. Make my day. You're the disease, I'm the cure. Ah! And all is well. Ripley is victorious, and the survivors live to fight another day. Well, says Hex, I guess we proved that man is smarter than any old aliens. Don't stop there, says Ripley. We also proved that woman is smarter and tougher than man. Bellhop agrees. I'll say. Boy, I wish I was half the man Ripley is. Hey, wait. I am. And that's Alienators, the Mad Magazine parody of Aliens. Some cheesy jokes, but that's mad for you. And there's enough poking fun at the movie that's fair enough, and maybe not quite as critical of certain things, such as explored with the Cracked parody, which made a constant point, among other things, of Alien having a certain gross-out appeal. Maybe the only disappointing thing to me here is that the design of the aliens in the actual article does not match with the aliens of the movie whatsoever. They go for their own designs. 
And that's fine, but I think they could have had a little more fun in recreating the look of the aliens, especially with the Alien Queen, while the end results just look like generic, goofy alien cartoons. It's especially disappointing considering how good and how accurate to the movie the design on the cover looks. But that's small enough potatoes, I guess. Overall, a respectable spoof. I think it was pretty funny. What do you think? Comment below and let me know. I was originally planning to have this up on April Fool's Day, but unfortunately lagged a little bit behind. Crippling anxiety has stopped me short in many areas, as I'm sure you may be experiencing yourself lately. But it's good and important to have a laugh. I'm doing nothing but watching funny movies and TV shows lately. That's how I try to stay sane. I hope you're having some good laughs too, and I hope you're staying safe, and I hope you at least got one cheap laugh out of the video. I mean, Hudson, as a giant chicken. Come on, that's comedy gold. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, and you can also subscribe to stay up to date with the latest from Alien Theory. My very special thanks to the Patreon Hive, Queen Albert Newell, Whaling Yutani Executives, Emurek, and Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley tier of excellence, Lady Anne. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.